My name is Juliette Kaim. I'm a professor at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. I'm also the faculty chair of the Homeland Security Program there and with Dr. Paul Farmer from Harvard Medical School, the co-faculty chair of the executive program on global health and security. There are typical things that you talk about when you talk about a global health crisis. We tend to think of war, or refugees, or mass migration, or an outbreak of Ebola. Uh, but really, one of the major themes that we have to begin to address is climate change. It's, it's going to cause mass migrations. It's going to cause refugees, which put strains on the global health community. It's going to um, denigrate uh, you know, populations of people who are weaker to address whatever global health challenges may exist. But it's not going away. I come from the world less of global health and more of the crisis side. And what we're seeing is clearly uh, what anyone who's looking at the weather today knows, that the storms are coming, becoming more frequent and stronger and lasting longer. They are no longer rare, and honestly, they're no longer random. Uh, there are communities, there are islands, there are seaports in this world that will not exist in the years to come. And what we've seen and what I saw in the Bahamas is not only will that cause a strain on the public health entities within that country, say the Bahamas, uh, but also on the global health community that has to basically fill in major gaps that are left uh, eviscerated in light of these storms. Uh, that's a strain on a community, on a global health community, that's sometimes used to coming in and then leaving. When I was talking to doctors at the Grand Bahamas, they anticipated that they would be there for a very long time, that there was no way that a single country or island could deal with the global health or public health challenges that were going to occur um, on the Grand Bahamas or Abaco. What those new challenges are for an entire global health community is something we have to begin to address in the context of climate change. So proof of how compelling and necessary this executive program is, is that uh, not just a couple weeks ago, um, I went to the Bahamas uh, to address the issues related to both their response and their long-term recovery. Uh, I do a lot of work in crisis management and what was so clear from the Bahamas, some early lessons, was the extent to which the global health and public health apparatus uh, were not only destroyed in the hurricane, uh, but also the extent to which the organizations in this space were working together to address a, a global health, a public health crisis, but also to ensure that it didn't cause more harm. So I arrived, um, you know, in Nassau and everything looks fine, right? So I mean, it's, this is a hurricane that only hit uh, two, um, uh, two islands, except uh, one of the biggest challenges was, of course, the evacuees that had come from Abaco and the Grand Bahamas. They're staying in shelters, of which their medical and public health needs and mental health needs have to be addressed in ways that are sensitive to things like privacy, uh, but also are addressing these longer term issues like mental health and what does it mean to be in a storm for 24 hours and also what in light of climate change what if they can't go back to their island what if the government decides that they're not going back and those challenges have to be addressed by a global health network that has to work together with governments with military with emergency responders but the other issues out of the bahamas are really really uh you know, sort of sobering at this stage. You have unaccounted for dead, and not just a few. The government remains consistent, at least to this day of this taping, that only about 54 people uh, died. Uh, that can't possibly be true, and even the government knows it's not true. People were uh, whisked out to sea and probably didn't survive, but there's a sense that there's a lot of bodies um, under the debris. You talk to people in the medical field and they say you can smell more bodies than you can find. Uh, that is their sense. That's a health crisis, of course, decomposing bodies, uh, con contaminate water, um, uh, uh, decompose in ways that are unhealthy to the air and the environment and people around them. But of course, it has mental health consequences. What does it mean to never be able to find a family member, to never have that kind of closure? 
And then, of course, for the surviving on those two main islands devastated, you see a network of a, uh, of a global in, uh, uh, core that is coming in to try to build public health facilities so that the immediate needs of the community in the Bahamas are addressed so that more harm isn't done. In other words, it's like triage. If you don't get in quickly, then the thing that you could have stopped and addressed becomes exacerbated and harms more for everything from mental health to, of course, uh, physical health. I had an opportunity opportunity to work with people in the medical field who had come uh, to the Bahamas to help, people from the International Medical Corps, for example. And they talk of, you know, not only needing to establish uh, shelters, right, and how do you do that with, a, with, with the Army and with uh, an international community, but uh, how you get trust in the community uh, to provide the kind of services that the community is not used to, or that the community uh, has never had the opportunity uh, to take advantage of. And so it's these kinds of uh, challenges that are squarely in the sort of public health and global health space that um, are sort of early lessons from the Bahamas uh, that um, are replicated in almost every crisis uh, that you can uh, imagine out there, whether it's a pandemic itself, um, or it's an earthquake, or it's a war, or it's a, a mass migration. And our capacity to deal with these, not just as national security issues or climate change issues, but also as global health issues, is really at the core about how fast we are going to recover and how fast we are going to be able to build stronger for the next war or crisis or whatever comes our way. So Bahamas becomes this moment, unfortunately, but in real time where we can see what is going on and the challenges to a health environment and the necessity of addressing it early so that the harms are not made worse than what Dorian uh, wrought on those islands. Public health is different. Global health is different. Sometimes it's the nature of the harm itself. You can't see it. It spreads. You don't know. Contamination can be difficult to focus on um, uh, a, a public health response is only as strong as the public health infrastructure that already exists. But what we also know is that other harms can occur, a hurricane, a tsunami. And if the public health apparatus is not prepared for it, then the response is going to be weak. I often say that a hurricane or a storm uh, encounters a society as it is, not as we want it to be. So Hurricane Katrina, we already had a, a, a city. So Hurricane Katrina, we already had a city that was plagued with racial problems and poverty. Uh, Hurricane Maria, the, it hits Puerto Rico, that's, whose infrastructure is already crumbling. And what I've most recently noted, and the stories I want to tell you about today, is obviously in the Bahamas. Um, I had an opportunity uh, to visit the Bahamas after Hurricane Dorian. I do a lot of writing and TV on sort of not just response management, but how to think about recovery. And what I discovered was what we're going to be discussing in the class, which is without the capacity to deal with the public health issue, um, and the challenges that are facing our communities or communities struck by disaster, you can't even begin to talk about recovery. Honestly, in the Bahamas, that begins with the dead. Uh, the official count as I tape this is still in the 50s. Bahamas will change that number over time. But there's still close to 1,000 people missing. Uh, maybe they were swept out to sea, but part of the challenge is the removal of debris and how do you find and identify bodies. That's a public health issue, of course, because if you have bodies, there's contamination, but it's also one that's important to a society. You, you can't respond to a disaster, move on from a disaster, unless you treat uh, the, those who are dead with dignity and respect. But the other challenges, of course, the obvious ones, which are that this entire, at least on the two islands of Abaco and Grand Bahamas, that the entire public health apparatus was essentially eviscerated. In Abaco, there was no working public health facilities. So you had to see an entire global network, as we often see in these disasters, build uh, build facilities to be able to address the public health harms. In Abaco, where they're not even sure they're going to return after a while, it's not quite clear what the public health apparatus is going to look like, but there are concerns about systemic and long-term effects of the public health unaddressed public health challenges that exist there. 
And there's a new twist in the Bahamas, is that even after you surge resources and you get these great organizations that come in and build the public health apparatus, working with the government, working with NGOs, those kind of management and leadership skills that we're going to uh, address, um, you still, you have something new in some of these storms, which is what I discovered in the Bahamas, which is actually a mental health, public health crisis. Uh, Dorian was different. It's the nature of climate change, something I'm very concerned about. Dorian was different. I mean, it was a category five hurricane, of course, but it lingered in a way that we had never seen before over Abaco for almost 24 hours. The mental impact and the public health impact of having a hurricane hover for that long is having long-term PTSD and other, uh, and other consequences for the community in the Bahamas that they're only now, a month later, starting to address. What makes security and global health different? Well, in some ways, it, it's worth knowing there are similarities. This is crisis management. It is what it is to establish an incident command and to get people to work uh, to save lives. There is something familiar about it. But there are things that are different about global health um, because it really does form the core of a strong and resilient society. If you don't have strong individuals and strong communities against uh, the things that can make us unhealthy. It's very hard to talk about, you know, crisis management or disaster management. And what we need to do is to recognize not just those similarities so that the people who come to the class or the people around the table know, okay, there's something familiar about this, but also the sort of cross-discipline um, needs of dealing with a global health uh, crisis. Uh, and those disciplines you well know, whether it's medicine or public health or military, who can build, you know, who can build a medical shelter or a medical facility quickly, right? You, you'd want military assets, emergency managers, NGOs, humanitarian relief efforts, um, the people, you know, WHO and organizations that write checks and the private sector that's distributing the vaccines, all of them have to work together. And while someone might be in charge, a country under stress or a leading minister of health, all of those different entities have to work together and lead towards a common solution. The problem, of course, is sometimes there's competing needs. Sometimes priorities have to be made. Sometimes you're making a choice between two bad options, but one is slightly better than the other. I have an example from this and where I saw this conflict between sort of this, these global health needs and, and all the other needs that you want in a crisis. I was in the Obama administration during the Haiti earthquake. Um, Haiti was in charge to, of the response at all times, but of course you saw you know, dozens if not hundreds of countries coming to help, in particular the United States. So there was a controversy at the time, which was of course the use of the US military. Uh, in the response efforts, and whether you whether there should have been other priorities. People will remember 20,000 U.S. troops were sent to Haiti to sort of stabilize the government. They weren't there for military needs. They were there to essentially for supply chain. But that came in conflict with other important needs, the orphans or the doctors without borders or, or other health needs that might have to be addressed. But from the government's perspective, they made a decision. And their decision was in the context of a real big operational problem, which is Haiti only had one working runway. So it wasn't like you could have everyone come and do whatever they needed to do and solve all the problems in one day. You had one working runway, which meant that an airplane could come in every 90 seconds or 120 seconds and had to get out after four minutes or however it worked at the time. And that meant that the Haitian government had to make really hard decisions about priorities. You'll hear from people in this class who didn't like those priorities, who thought something else should have been done. You'll hear from me who thought maybe this is the best priority. But they decided that they had to prioritize water and food distribution over the kids or the orphans or even medical care. Uh, because their thought was, if you can get water and food into this country quickly and distribute it to those who needed it, you would essentially stop, you know, stop the bleeding, so to speak. You would stop the continuing harm. Then you could try to address all the other issues. That's why 20,000 troops were chosen over, say, Doctors Without Borders or humanitarian relief efforts. Now, 10 plus years later, maybe all of those choices were wrong. Who knows? Maybe they were right in, in the context of really bad options. But 
to be successful in this space, you have to understand what those options are and those competing interests and either be willing to promote yours or actually see yours to maybe a greater interest in this case, 20,000 troops being able to distribute water and food. These are not easy discussions um, and sometimes there's no perfect answer. These are the kinds of threats that we're gonna look at, the climate change, conflict, um, uh, uh, pandemics and, uh, and uh, public health pandemics that really challenge our notion of crisis management and leadership because it brings together different disciplines from the military to, to public health, to law enforcement, to emergency managers that have to work together, not through this chain of command, but through a unity of effort, through bringing these disciplines together um, uh, to address it. But secondly, that we have to focus on how do we build a stronger public health infrastructure, not just when the thing happens, when the bad thing happens, but in preparation for the kinds of challenges our globe is going to face, whether it's climate refugees or disasters or conflict. That the risks that our societies face and our communities face can be infinite. It could be terrorism or a hurricane or a pandemic um, or a cyber attack or whatever else. Um, and that we need to be able to identify and work with different disciplines about how to address what those threats and risks are. So over the course of the week, you will be joined by Kennedy School faculty and faculty throughout Harvard who will guide you in a discussion about the leadership and management skills necessary to address the global health and security issues that we are all going to face in the future.